Welcome to another episode of My Camera's Falling Apart. I'm Nell, and today we're going to be talking about CPUs and machine code and assembly language. Okay, so most people, if I said, hey, what's your CPU? What's a CPU? What does it do? They'd be like, oh, it's a CPU. It's a central processing unit. It's the brains of the computer. Or they'd be like, that's the chip where all the the horsepower comes from, or that's where the calculations take place. But what exactly is a fucking CPU? You probably know that it takes machine code and it makes your computer chooch, but what the fuck is machine code? And if you've built a computer, you probably know, you know, you have a CPU, it runs at a specific clock rate, there's different CPUs with different threads, there's features like hyper-threading, it might have integrated chipset features. What is all that shit? So the first time I ever heard the word CPU was actually from my aunt. She was explaining to me when I was like six years old the pieces of a computer. She was like, this is the screen, and this is the CPU, and this is the keyboard. Throughout my childhood I've heard several adults try to tell me what the pieces of the computer were and you know I've had the monitor referred to as the TV, the screen, and the tower or you know the actual computer people would refer to as oh that's the brains or that's the drive I've heard that's the drive I had one person refer to it as a modem right after high school I did like computer repair work at like a retail store and people would still say that kind of shit like older people so like but anyway obviously the cpu is the chip inside the computer that makes it go woo so what the fuck so today i'm going to talk a little bit about your cpu machine code and what assembly language is these are all things i think most people know what they kind of do, but I think they only know like textbook definitions for what they kind of do. And obviously some of you know exactly what they do, and you could write machine code directly in a hex editor, but I'll pre-assume that that's not the case. So let's start with the pseudo-obvious. So obviously your processor is a piece of hardware that runs instructions, uh, program code, operating system code, whatnot. It reads and writes to memory, it interfaces with peripherals, and uh, it does all your computations. What are computations? Well, you know, you know your computer can like... So what are some things your computer can do? Well, you know, you can play games, you can mine Bitcoin, you can display web pages, but your processor doesn't really have instructions for like render HTML or, you know, compute hash. Typically the instructions that your processor can handle are very basic things. These days it's completely normal for your processor to do things like matrix math or advanced computations, maybe even encryption. But if we look at historically, like let's for example take the MOS 6502, it's a very popular popular processor. It's what was in your Nintendo Entertainment System, it's what was in your Commodore computers, your Apple II computers. I mean, I'm sure you've played a Nintendo game, so you understand like what types of things are involved with that. So this processor could not multiply or divide. Uh, it could not do, you know, sine, cosine. It couldn't really do a lot of things that a basic calculator could do. It still got the job done because it implemented just enough instructions to make anything else doable in software, which give or take is the definition of what a Turing machine is. It's a machine that given enough instructions and time, it could compute anything that's computable. It might not be fast, but the 6502 is certainly capable of doing a lot of interesting things. It only implements instructions such as add, subtract, compare, jump, jub subroutine, return subroutine. It only had three interrupts and it doesn't know anything about decimal places or fractions or anything along those lines. So how does it work? So processors don't have variables, they have registers, and these are literal pieces of hardware that register some value. You don't get to just say like y equals x plus b, you literally have to move x into the right register and then tell it to add with y, and then your result is going to be in that register, so then if the next thing you're going to do isn't to that same exact number, then you've got to copy it out and put it back where you want it. And you are very explicit with RAM, there is no, you know, give me RAM, you know, give me free space, 
space, you know, declare X as an integer. Like, that doesn't exist at the machine code level. It doesn't exist at the assembly level. You're literally telling the processor, here's, here's the memory address I want you to put this at. And you better know what that memory address should be, either because you got it from the operating system or because, like, you're writing an NES game and you know exactly what memory addresses are available to you and you've written it out on paper and you know that memory address FECD is where the number of lives go and it's never going to change because you're not running an operating system that moves memory around. You're not running in protected mode, you're running in real mode. So every address you tell the processor, every offset that it, it calculates is a physical address in RAM where you're lighting up lines on the address bus to tell the RAM where the next address is that you want to put a number into or get a number out of. That's the biggest misconception is that the processor is just some lower tier level of operating system that just, you know, has a, a, a big list of commands it can handle. It, it, it's not commands, they're, they're hardware, they're, they're lines, they're, they're, those numbers actually translate into physical traces on the motherboard. Intel just can't be like, oh, we're gonna renumber the add command, like it doesn't work like that. Aside from compatibility issues, the actual opcode that an instruction has, you know, like 69 for add, that number literally is physically set in silicon. It's like back in the old days, you're phone number wasn't just, you know, some logical phone number that you could change at will. Your phone number was your phone number because that's the way that your, your phone line was wired into the switch. And if you wanted to change your number, they had to rewire the switch. It's called machine code because you're literally sending code into the hardware. And at that point, there's no, there's no indirection in software where Intel can push out an update. And that's a lie. There's something called microcode, but the pins on the chip go high and low, high and so each instruction has an opcode and then it has one or more arguments, um, but not the way you think. So like as we discussed, the add command doesn't take in one number and another number and spit out a number. The add command takes in an address mode and an argument. So like if you want to add four to what's in the A register, you would use the immediate mode and your argument would be four because that four is never going to change. It's, it's hard coded in your program. But if you wanted to add the A register to something in memory, you could use a different memory addressing mode. So add the A register to what's in memory at this address. And it's, again, they're not like variables. Like the 6502 had three registers, A, X, and Y, and you couldn't use them all for anything. It wasn't orthogonal. You could not just say, hey, add X and Y, or add A and X, or add A and Y. There were very specific ways that the hardware was wired. So if you wanted to do something with X, and it, it, the processor doesn't have an instruction to do it with X, you have to move X into A. And at the machine level, there's no such thing as a, an if-then-else. There's no while loop. There's no for loop. So you don't have a, an if X equals one then do this. You have put one in the A register, now compare that to memory address where X is. Uh, and then you have branch if equal, branch if not equal. So that's another important thing, a lot of the mathematical comparisons are actually done by just looking at status registers that are set by the previous instruction. You don't tell a, a processor, check if this number is lower than this number. All you do is you say compare these two numbers. And in hardware, it does all the comparisons at once, and there's various status flags in the status register that tell you if the result overflowed, if the result was zero, if the result was negative, and based on these flags you can tell if something was equal, if it was greater than or equal to, if it was greater than or less than or whatever, because of the way that the processor is wired. There's no functions, there's no control structure. If you want to execute anything other than the next instruction, you're either jumping or you're jumping with subroutine, and you're literally just telling the processor, move here next. And you're not telling the processor to move here next, you're literally taking that next address and you're pushing it into the program counter. The program counter is a register that stores the address of the next instruction the CPU is going to execute. And normally the CPU on its own just increases that by one every time it pulls in an instruction. But when you want to jump someplace, all you got to do is put the new address there. The instruction is called jump, but it's really the same as just writing a value to a register. That's how fundamental we're talking. The most granular with control flow that the processor gets is called jump with subroutine. And it's really just jumping, except before it jumps, it takes the current address and it pushes it onto the stack so that later on, after you run a bunch of code, you can return from subroutine, which is just all that instruction does is it pops the address off the stack and, and jumps there. But these functions don't like check to make sure that the stack actually has 
the right address. Like, you can return from subroutine even if you didn't jump to the subroutine. And likewise, you can jump to a subroutine and, and then never come back and leave something on the stack by accident. Like, the processor doesn't fucking care. There's a lot more functionality in what these instructions are called than what the processor actually does. Like, it doesn't know about subroutines. It literally is just a combination of pushing the current address here and then jumping here with the expectation that no one's gonna fuck the stack up if the address is wrong or whether someone puts something else on the stack since then and it's not gonna be the right value like the processor has no idea it doesn't fucking give a fuck there's there's no error checking there's no bounds checking that's up to you as the software developer or the compiler to understand how you're using these numbers so that takes us into assembly language. What is assembly language? So most people would say, oh, that's one step above machine code. Like that's one step above writing ones and zeros right to your processor. Assembly language is really just human interface language. It's something that we came up with to make it easier to write machine code. In assembly language, all the instructions are still the same exact instructions your processor executes. So assembly language for a 6502 is not assembly language for a 386, is not assembly language for a power PC. Each architecture has its own assembly language because each architecture has different opcodes, different instructions, different instruction lengths, formats, address layouts, an endianness, which bit comes first? Is the highest bit in, in the byte over here or is the highest bit over here? What assembly language really does is it gives humans three different tools that they didn't have if they were just writing bits and bytes into a hex editor to create a, a, a program. Uh, the first one is it, it has comments. You know, you can comment things and you can represent numbers in convenient formats. You don't have to write it in hex. Or you don't have to write it in binary. You can do decimal. You can do some very basic math. You know, you can say five times five and when it gets assembled in a machine code, it's going to know that it's always going to be 25. It doesn't turn into an instruction. Um, but it's not a compiler. It doesn't dictate the order of the code in the file. It doesn't dictate where variables are stored. There are no variables in a assembly language, anything that is not a direct instruction of the processor is some macro that the assembler itself supports. It's not part of the actual canonical code base that the processor is going to see. Number two is that you don't have to know the opcodes. You can say jump, JMP, you can say JSR, you can say RTS or RET. You don't have to know every single number. The assembler knows what syntaxes are valid and it knows what instructions and opcodes to map them to. But it still doesn't reorder them. It doesn't manage memory for you. It doesn't even know what the memory space looks like. It doesn't care. It just takes the human cuteness and and turns it into numbers. The biggest advantage of assembly language is that if you try to write machine code of any meaningful program other than a couple instructions, any place where you're gonna have to loop, where you're gonna have to branch, you're gonna quickly run into the fact that the processor, when you jump around, jump up, jump up and get down, jump, 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 when you jump around execution, you need to know the address that you're going to. And if you're writing code, you you don't know the address that your your conditional is going to branch to because you didn't write it yet. You're typing this into a hex editor or writing it down on paper. If you're doing this as a human, you're going to have to like leave a blank spot and fill it in later. And then if any part of the program changes, you got to go around and update all these offsets. So what the assembler does is it labels, it lets you label things. So you can label your subroutines and your pieces of code and your memory addresses, which by the way, in assembly language are the exact same thing memory like variables that you're using for work ram like you know how many lives you have left in this game and code like where the subroutine to draw the screen starts it doesn't care a label is a label it just points to a memory address so there is no differentiation in assembly language. You can jump into data, or you can define instructions and numbers. It doesn't matter. It's just shoving all this thing together into one constant stream of numbers. So if you have a label here, it could be used as memory, it could be used as code. That's the beauty of a von Neumann architecture, which is all the computers we think about in our daily lives are von Neumann machines. What that means is that code and memory are treated the same way. They're put into the same address space, 
device, and unless the processor gets one into its instruction register as something it needs to execute, it, it doesn't need to be a valid instruction. If you think about like a basic calculator, like like one of those little sharp calculators with like 15 keys on it, those are non-Von Neumann machines. You have memory, like you can put numbers in memory and you can get numbers out of memory, but you can't put instructions in memory. Like you can't set M1 to be you know this you know the operator you can only set m1 to be the result of an operation so that's a non von neumann machine all of the computers that we use and virtually everything else these days is von neumann architecture and unless you try to execute something the processor doesn't care if that number five is supposed to be an instruction or it's supposed to be you know number of balls on the screen or it's just a piece of a string it doesn't matter we're just moving numbers around and when it comes time to execute something those numbers just make the processor do different things so in a sense you're just gonna see label blah colon if you watched any of my two videos where I explain sonic bugs you've seen assembly code and you see that you know even though we have labeled sections of instructions you know sonic die or sonic hurt or play sound these are just temporary names we're giving to wherever in the file that that line happens to be if that line that instruction winds up being at address you know 450 into the Genesis ROM well, that label, every place we use it, is going to get replaced with value 450 in hex when it gets written out, when it gets assembled. I hope that makes sense. In a high-level language where you have a compiler or an interpreter, you're not telling, you're probably not even capable of telling the compiler, hey, I want to use this memory address, I want to use this register. You may be able to give the compiler hints, but typically you write, you know, you declare a variable, you give it a value, you do something with it. You don't know or care where in memory that winds up being, where, what register it winds up getting used on. You don't care, you just know that you need to multiply the number. and if you you're using some external library even better you don't need to know how to draw to the screen OpenGL will do that for you just run a function but at the end of the day all that gets compiled into native code whether it's getting compiled and executed interpreted on the fly whatever eventually it's gonna boil down to something that your processor knows how to do but it doesn't know how to do it it's wired to do it I hope this sheds some light on things these days, though, your CPU does more than just add, subtract, compare, move data around, and do bitwise calculations. It can do a lot of things. And beyond the CPU, there's a lot of other things that are integrated with the CPU on that same chip. You know, your CPU is wired to do sound, it can do video, it can do networking, it can control other devices on your motherboard. It knows how to run the whole USB bus. So back in the day, these were all going to be separate chips, and these are all things you had to communicate with in a shared memory address space. On the next video, I hope to talk about interrupts, kernels, and what an operating system is, and get into some concepts like real mode versus protected mode, and memory management, and virtual memory, and paging. If this topic piqued your interest, I highly suggest you check out, where is it going to show up? It's going to show up up here. I highly suggest you check out this playlist by Ben Eater. Ben Eater is one of my favorite channels, and in this playlist he builds an 8-bit CPU from scratch. And once you watch these videos, which are really interesting, you will understand a hell of a lot more about what your computer, calculator, digital camera, game system, TV, what they're all doing under the hood. It's a really great introduction, and it's kind of really fucking cool. If you like this video, do the thumbs up thing. If you want to watch more, do the bell thing. And if you want to support me, do the uh, Patreon thing so maybe I can get a camera that's not falling apart. Until next time, stay safe. Cheese, cheese. All I want to do is save you money.